Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Christine Garlisi. I'm the executive director of the Lois and Richard Nicotra Foundation, and I'm the chief operating officer of their Nicotra Group, which is the for profit arm of their enterprises. And I'm a double St. John's alumna. I went to the Staten Island campus and got a degree in speech and communication. And I got my master's degree on the Queens campus in government and politics and a certificate in public administration. Good morning, my friend, Laura Jean, over to you. Hi, Christine. Uh, I'm Laura Jean Waters. I'm with the Staten Island Foundation. We're a private foundation um, that had originally been founded by Staten Island Bank and Trust. Um, and when that bank was sold, first to independence and then sovereign and then finally Santander, the board of directors of the foundation held the, the foundation separate from the sale of the bank so that the funds would always stay on Staten Island. Um, I am uh, a graduate of Manhattan College uh, with a degree in biology and psychology, and um, I am a, a lawyer. I went to Brooklyn Law School um, and uh, had been the director of Staten Island's Arts Council before coming to the foundation in 2007. And I'd love to be able to see all of you. I guess- No. You, I guess you can't like just pop in front of the screen. I feel like I don't want to be that person that says some brave person go up and stand next to the professor, but it's a little one sided. But Laura, I'm going to pretend I'm talking to you, Laura Jean, and yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll do like the same. That. And when I teach, I usually do something a little non traditional and I say, I hope everyone takes their phone out. So if we can't see you, but I'm going to just trust that everyone's going to take their device out and connect with us either by, um, you know, however you want to, whatever platform you're on, our names are on the screen and follow along with what we're saying. But at the same time, you know, we'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn, especially uh, because I think that it's always good to use the time as a student to build your connections. So I hope you don't mind, Laura Jean, that I didn't tell them to take their phone out. Usually yeah. people say put their phone away and connect, but Take your phone out and, you know, if there's something that we say that is interesting to you, I'm going to post later that we were speaking to this class and what we spoke about. So I would love if you commented later on because it builds more of a relationship. Because right now this feels very one sided, right? <laughs> yeah, but at least we're together. Um, it'd be great. To, I, you know, I don't know that young people are still on Facebook. That seems like so old fashioned at this point. But um, if, the class is interesting, interested in hearing positive things about Staten Island um, following Love Staten Island is. Uh, that would be wonderful. And we are on Instagram. So I know a lot of you will probably be there. So um, Lori Jean, thank you for that. I appreciate it. So I carry this love wherever I go. Um, so it's very important to us to share our mission, but also to elevate other uh, nonprofit groups in our community and we use the love Staten Island group on Facebook and on Instagram to make sure that we're doing that and I also share a lot of that type of content on my LinkedIn so anywhere you are we're there um, Twitter too so Laura Jean I have the questions in front of me so Terrific. maybe since let's go. Um, let's go so Anthony asked do you believe that if I engage in corporate philanthropies businesses are creating a positive public image for themselves and at the same time enhancing the relationship they have built with consumers. So I will say, absolutely, um, you know, building a reputation as community builders and philanthropists is important to our reputation and our legacy. Is it the only reason we do it? No, it would be too exhausting. <laughs> it's more involved than any marketing campaign would ever be. Um, and we are held to such a higher standard. It'd be much easier to take out paid ads um, on different social media platforms and leave our brand to that. This is an investment of time, effort, and consistency over the course of the last decade for us at the Nicotra Foundation. Laura Jean? Yeah, and as I said, the um, we, we were founded by a bank, but we're no longer attached to, to a bank. Um, I think the endeavor of philanthropy is 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 complex and um, takes a lot of thought um, 
I think that uh, having a, a philanthropic arm alone isn't enough. Um, and you know, sometimes when you're in the midst of something, whatever that endeavor is, um, when you're in the midst of something, you think that everybody's paying attention. Um, but you know, there's a great big world, and everybody's really busy. And so, yeah. getting your name out there and um, sort of, if it's important to you to market the good work you're doing, that's a that's a whole nother endeavor in itself. Um, and I think, you know, for, for us, um, because we aren't attached to a, a, a bank or, or some kind of corporate endeavor where we need customers, we don't necessarily have to put our name on something. Um, that's a bit of a luxury in some, in some cases, but you won't see the Staten Island Foundation on a lot of buildings, et cetera. But, um, our, our colleagues at Richmond County Savings Foundation and the Northfield and two other um, philanthropic organizations, um, part of the way they give, they make sure that there are naming opportunities, like they might have their name on a hospital room so that it's not only just the giving of a grant, but it's marketing that aspect. Um, that 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 becomes part of the whole um, process. And you know, right now, there's the concept of are you being performative when you do good? And I think that you know, yesterday I signed up uh, for a local walk that's in memory of a of a neighbor who died um, overseas serving our country, and I posted about it. And for a brief second before I hit post, I thought, oh, is this performative? Because I didn't sign up to tell people I'm volunteering. I signed up because I want to give back and I believe if you spend time doing community events, it makes the community better. But I, I did post it and it was because I do think that naming opportunities or sharing that you're doing something good in your, in your community is a sense of mentoring and modeling for other people. It encourages them and informs them. And um, you know people aspire to, to do things, to do good, and sometimes they just don't know how. So I think that, you know, Anthony brings up a very good point. Is it performative? Is it part of a marketing or is it part of who you are? I can authentically say it's part of who we are. And I just want to take a second because I've got my LinkedIn open and I, um, Professor Fowler, is Damien there? Damien Rivera. Damien gets a gold star. He's already connected. And I see Damien is a marketing student. So Damien, look, I broke out my St. John's mug. If you want to take a picture of the screen and post it on LinkedIn that you you attended and the person who is speaking <laughs> recognized you for being first up, Gold Star Damien. So good for you. And I'm going to be uh, posting later. I'm going to tag Damien. So anybody else should do the same. Um, Anthony also asked, what's a strategy when starting on a new project that you have yet to work on? Well, for us, every project is new. We're only 10 years old. Um, so although we do fund projects uh, repetitively, most of the things that we come across that we fund are small one off events and programs. So we go forward in good faith, meaning that we, um, we just have a lot of trust that people are going to say what they're going to, you know, what they're doing is what they're going to do. Um, we trust, but verify, we follow up to make sure that the funds were spent. Um, Laura Jean, I think you have a, a bigger answer to this question because you're making such a huge investment. Well. You know, um, I think you know some of what you say is, is, would be true for for the way I work. But um, what came to mind? We're just um, launching a, a fellowship program that was brand new. It's a fellowship in social work. It's an area that I didn't really know all that much about, um, and so I did like what Christine was talking about, you know, setting up your network. I used my network. Um, all of the colleagues that I knew I took out, it was like it was really old fashioned. I took out uh, a legal pad and a pen and I wrote down everybody that I could think of that knew something about social work. And I made appointments to speak to them. And I got in, in a relatively short time, I felt like I got quite the education in, in social work. So it's really depending on uh, the network of colleagues that you build up over time. 
That's great. And you know, Lori Jean, you just reminded me of something. When I was a student at St. John's, I went to a career seminar and I remember the person talking and I remember who he was because I connected with him at the time, took a business card, more old fashioned. And he was talking about building your own board of trustees and that yeah. over the course of your lifetime, you build your own board of trustees. And it's so much easier now because, you know, people can connect with us in the virtual setting and just kind of keep us on their board in a sense. And in 10 years say, you know, you spoke in my St. John's class and I remember you were an expert in this area. Um, so that's what a great tip. And then Brianna asks, how's the amount of funding for grants and aid configured during COVID? Sadly, um, so our funding is from a social enterprise eatery, the Commons Cafe. So if you're not familiar with the social enterprise, that is when a for-profit business gives 100% of the profits away to do good, to do whatever their mission is. So our mission is to help nonprofits on Staten Island and also to provide scholarships, some at St. John's, for our um, employees, children, and grandchildren. But sadly, the source of our funding, which is the Commons Cafe, a quick service eatery, and I say it's like the Shake Shack that gives back, same kind of menu, but we give 100% of our profits away. We had to close for almost a year during COVID because we are in a corporate park. And as people weren't going to their offices, they also weren't stopping in for the salad or the cup of coffee. So we reopened about a year ago and we're rebuilding our business. So it's almost like we've had a grand opening again, but we're also about to open our second social enterprise eatery. Uh, Pienza. So that'll be another reason to visit Staten Island when you uh, have the chance. And we expect to double our giving. We're just getting to the point now where we're profitable again. So we need that profit in order to give away. We don't have a, um, like Laura Jean, you have, you want to describe a little bit how you're set up. It's a little different. Okay. But before you leave Carmen's Cafe, the salads are really good. So They're delicious and made to order. You can have Oh, good. Susan's putting her thumb up we, there, you know, and, and Mr. Nakocha said when we opened, as good as our mission is, our food has to be better yeah. because no one's going to come back just to feel good. It has to taste good. And so the, our motto is eat good, do good. It, it does. And um, yeah. so the way that we get our funding is um, from uh, the sale of stocks when, when uh, the bank was sold we have a corporate corpus of money that is invested and when the stock market does well our funds do well and um so recently um within the last two years things have been going very well a, a little bit less well if you're following the market over the past couple of weeks um <clears throat> but there have been a number of crises um, in the last 20 years that the foundation has responded to. First, after 9-11, um, the stock market crash in, in the early 2000s, um, Superstorm Sandy, all of those crises, the foundation created a, a special fund and set up um, a grant opportunity for local nonprofits. And we expected when uh, the lockdown occurred that we would probably do the same thing, uh, recognizing that our nonprofits would be responding to local need. And our board of directors surprised us and said, no, we don't want to set up a special fund. And, you know, <laughs> I think um, at first staff was taken aback um, and, and a little concerned. But they actually were very wise. And I think this is why you have a board of directors. You have a variety of perspectives and, and viewpoints. Um, they recognized that, A, the federal government um, was going to step in and provide a lot of funding, which did happen. And a lot of our local nonprofits took advantage of that. But they also recognized that the way this crisis rolled out, there would be continuing um aftershocks there would be continuing effects and i think that that's really true so we paid special attention to those requests that came in um asking for support because of the pandemic um, but at the same time we didn't set up a special fund that would be limited in time we're still seeing the after effects and i would say that within the last six months i'm starting to see organizations who um, are 
in, in, in a different kind of crisis. They're open now, but there's all kinds of things like the- like You're in the staffing crisis. crisis. There, staffing it's, crisis. A, it's a different world. In fact, yeah. my daughter is doing her uh, Girl Scout Gold Award and we decided that she's, she's doing, um, I was talking to her about this because nonprofits are suffering even though they're open because they lost staffing. So un, sometimes positions are deemed not vital, like a marketing position or PR position to social media for a nonprofit. But what it does is it feeds the nonprofit's um, mission by sharing the mission and doing calls to action. So my daughter's doing a Dropbox with all evergreen posts that that social media platforms can use, nonprofits can use if they don't have a marketing person. Because I think that they won't have a resource to hire these non-vital positions, which as a marketing person, I think that it's vital, but I can understand, you know, you need the frontline person before. Um, I'm gonna skip a little bit around and just so that we um, get to some variety of questions. Um, is it necessary for employees to be involved in philanthropy related activities? Connie Kim asks that. And no, I will say it is not necessary. Like if we are involved in supporting an event, no. However, I will say people who are enthusiastic about our mission are the employees who have longevity here because the buy in when you're doing nonprofit work, I do think is very important. Laura Jean, what do you think? Yeah, well, we we only have two employees at the at at the moment, so that it's a little bit um, difficult for me to answer on, on a you know personal basis. But my observations are that the um, for organizations who have employees who can go out and do volunteer work, um, it's sort of a way for the the corporation to you know vote with its its person power and um you know so an organization that can mobilize staff to do a blood drive or go in and paint a mural things like that really is showing a, a tremendous amount of uh goodwill for the community and and shows uh you know, it's like another demonstration of where the corporate heart is at. So I, I, I think it really is important. You know, that's a beautiful phrase, corporate heart. I have a number of things here since we've been doing virtual meetings for so long. I have like uh, show and tell things. So this book, um, The Power of Nice, Mr. and Mrs. Nakocher, who are the owners and founders of our company, we all get this book when we start. Um, it's a small book. You can see I have some pages uh, that are our favorites. They actually gave this to me before I worked for them when I worked at St. John's University as a fundraiser. And I think that when you are looking for a career, I know we all look at compensation and we look at title, but I would also encourage you, like Lori Jean just said, look at the heart of the organization, because if it's a good fit, you know, compensation and title don't get you out of bed in the morning. They just don't. Um, and they don't keep you coming to a place. Like when I worked at St. John's, I real and I was fundraising for scholarships. I was a scholarship recipient when I was a student. So when you're fundraising, you're selling something that doesn't exist. You're selling a feeling. And so, you know, I knew how it felt for a stranger to support my education. And so making that connection to the heart of what you're talking about is very important. And now that I sit on the other side of the desk as a grant, a uh, grantor instead of a grantee, I still want to have that connection and feel excited about what we're supporting. And Laura Jean Brianna asks, why did you choose to focus on improving student literacy? And I think that dovetails with what we were just talking about. Yeah, it, it sure does. Because I mean, you know, as soon as I saw that, that question, Brianna, it started to tear up a little bit because, um, and, and not all of our grants are about student literacy but when somebody does talk to me about how to change the trajectory of a child's life by taking them from being a struggling reader to opening up the doors of all the possibilities in the world by yes. allowing them to read um I, I it's really emotional and you know we do three million dollars in giving each year um there's a part of me that wishes that we could direct every dollar to them, because I think I think 
if every child could read. And there's so many different reasons why somebody struggles with reading. Um, but if we can teach everyone to read, I think it'll be a different world. And and part of that is I'm a reader. I love, love to read, book. right? So read. the the indulgence a little bit, I think, when we do grant work is that you know we right. do have things that we're passionate about. So it's very important when you're talking to somebody who's giving you a grant. And so when I was a fundraiser, I would go meet with alumni. The most important thing you do when you're a fundraiser is listen. So in listening to Laura Jean right now, I would hear that she's a passionate reader and I would make sure that any applications I'm sending her have maybe a little bit of a component of literacy. Not that it has to be about literacy, but maybe it's about education in some way. Um, so Damien, who was the we one who to, connected- We have to answer Damien's question because he has yes. the gold star, right? I, I asked Damien, I went and looked for your name. Like now you're gonna be sorry that you sent the links in request, but where, where is everybody else? How many people are in this class, uh, Professor Fowler? So Damien asks, you've made careers out of helping others and improving the lives of those in your community. What motivates you? And he also asks, how do you rally support for projects? So for us, it's not really about rallying support for the project. It's about rallying support for the Commons Cafe. So we do market um, to tell people to come eat. So we have an Instagram, Commons Cafe. Uh, we have Facebook um, and we try to tell people about our mission as much as the meal. So we say your meal is on a mission. And when people get excited about coming to eat with us or hosting a community day where their nonprofit group can get 100% of the profits. So sometimes sororities and fraternities from schools like St. John's will come and do an event, a community day event at the cafe and they get to take 100% of the profits and give it to a nonprofit. Um, that's exciting to us because we're building community. Um, so that's what motivates me. Um, the Love Staten Island group is, if I'm being honest, like an extra burden I've placed on myself to moderate it. It's not a necessity. It's not really part of my job description at all. Um, but for the 13 students sitting here, if you can say at your job that you're doing extra because you just feel like it's the right thing to do, it feels good, um, then I, I'm okay putting in hours that maybe don't bring money to the bottom line, um, but they they expand on our general mission, which is to connect with the community. Uh, Laura Jean? Yeah, and, and we don't have to rally support for the projects that we make grants for. I mean, that's really not our role. Right. But th there are ways that I think um, I can support the things that we we have approved grants for, and that is, yeah. Somebody once said that I was like the Yenta of Staten Island. That <laughs> I was I was all about matchmaking, and probably you know my I love that. back in the old country were matchmakers. That that's a way that I think that I can support people's good work by recognizing that if somebody who's doing a food distribution um, could improve what they're doing because they also have somebody who can bring benefits to the people that distri distributing food to, maybe I can connect the two of them and they can have a conversation. And you never know what the, right. what the outcome is going to be when you put Yeah, too together. often. We're always, you know, as a society, we're so focused on numbers and money obviously being a big part of that. But I agree if if you ask me what my what I feel my biggest talent is, it's bringing people to the table together who maybe haven't met. So I view the Nakotra Foundation almost like a nonprofit chamber of commerce. So when we gift our checks, we don't put any checks in the mail. So in a normal non-pandemic year, we're cutting about 400 checks a year. So we meet with every single nonprofit group. It is a hefty uphill climb to do that. So when we have our grant awards, we ask everyone to come who's receiving a grant in that period to meet. We do a very brief presentation and usually people stay at the Commons Cafe and have a cup of coffee together. And so often that leads to a new relationship and that is beautiful. It's almost like watching a garden grow as you look at everybody standing there together. 
Um, so Staten Island's a little unique, but I think it's very much like any small town community, except that we're just, you know, the big, the small town in the big city. Um, so Robert asks, how do you identify investments critical to the community while ensuring they will not be a waste? In other words, what is your risk management process? Laura Jean? Yeah. Um... One of the things that we take a look at is kind of dry and uh, a little, it, it, it can be boring. Some people get excited about it, and that is looking at data. There's lots of public data out there that we take um, advantage of. Um, there are poverty rates. There is literacy rates. Um, there are public health data points. Um, and we pay attention to those to see what the big picture is uh, for our community um, and how our community stacks up against the, the rest of the city. In some cases, you're able to drill down to individual neighborhoods. And that's where we end up paying attention. As I said, we, we have $3 million a year to, um, to make grants with. Um, and we, and we do, Robert, we wanna make sure that those are going in to the places where that will matter the most. Um, and so over the course of the last few years, we've really been paying more attention to the needs of the North Shore of Staten Island, where um, the pockets of poverty are, are larger and some of the challenges caused by racism and other uh, societal ills really show up the most. Um, and so that, you know, that's sort of um, one of the ways that we make sure that we're using the dollars in, in the best way possible. Um, I see, and we have a very small staff for our nonprofit arm. We have 500 employees on our for-profit side, which is two hotels, nine office buildings, 400 acres of land, of white linen tablecloths, yes. Hold on a second. What does this mean? Do you have five room? Huh. I I can imagine. It must be a political minefield sometimes. And the and the gatekeeping is what I'm talking yeah. about in terms of that is very time consuming. Hi, Susan. Everybody's back. Yeah. Um. Can everybody just stand up and see if they can see you? Stand up. Ah. Uh, go stand in front. I'll take. Go stand in front of the room. Everybody go stand by your professor. <laughs> as long as you're all up. <laughs> go ahead. Are you there? Good. I'm going to take a picture. Wave. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, good, good, good. All right, smile, Laura Jean. We're going to take a picture. <laughs> Love it, guys. I'll post it later. So we just have a few minutes, right, left, Professor Fowler? I think. How long is your class until? Ten thirty. Oh, okay. So you yeah, right. I, I have a call. I I sort of have a hard stop at ten. Okay. okay. Um. Let me find one that's good for you. Foundations and government funders. Mm, I'm trying to think. How do organizations fit into the entire New York City national and international system of philanthropy? Because we're both located on Staten Island. So how do we see ourselves fitting in? Go ahead, Laura Jean. Oh, I, I think that's it's a really important question. Um, because as I've said a few times, we're we're only a three million dollar a year foundation and the needs on Staten Island grow exponentially every couple of years. So we really do need partnerships. And so again, it's all about relationships. And so um I make it my business to attend, of course, it's easier now um, on Zoom, to attend things um, citywide and regionally and make relationships with other organizations um, um, and other, other funders. And, that, and, and it's reciprocated then that they know that they, if they have questions about Staten Island um, and they don't have, um, contacts here that they can be in touch with us. So after Superstorm Sandy, um, the foundation um, 
raised an additional $2 million from funders who didn't have a presence here, but wanted to be of assistance to people who uh, suffered from, from the storm. So those, you know, having those kinds of relationships um, really made a difference. And for us, um, I endeavor to represent Staten Island in all that we do and elevate Staten Island's um, brand, so to speak. So I think Laura Jean's work the work of any foundation and any community um, does good and sends a message that we are a community that supports each other um, and we're trying to elevate each other. Like any community, sometimes one bad thing coming out of a community can can lower the esteem of the community. Um, so I think that's how we fit in by doing the Love Staten Island movement, by funding small nonprofits like Boy Scout troops and schools that wanna do something and they just need a little extra help to make it even better. We really, the Nacocha Foundation endeavors to lift, uh, to lift the image of Staten Island, uh, which I already think is wonderful, but everybody, everybody could use a little polish, a little more polish. Um, so the Nacotras have you know, given me such latitude to get involved in things off island. So I recently uh, interviewed and became a part of a mentoring pro program through the mayor's office. And um, so by gifting my time, because really it's the Nacocha's gift because they're compensating me for my time right now. Um, so by allowing me to speak to you, by gifting my time to the mentoring program, we are trying to branch off island and, and connect with the rest of the city. Not the rest of the nation yet, though I will say I've had occasion to represent the Nacotras um, in California at Facebook headquarters because we were recognized as a community builder, one of only 100 groups in the entire world. We were selected. It's not something you can apply for, and they flew me to California. So it was wonderful to bring um, the New York presence and the Staten Island presence to Facebook to tell them how they could do a better job of building community. Um, I know you have to to get going, Laura Jean. I could stay. It could stay another about fifteen minutes, Susan. Okay, so um, Laura one Jean, if I, one last question. Okay, I didn't want to cut in. Um, how do you go about starting up a foundation and applying where it's and applying funds where it's needed? That's Jared's question. Hmm. hmm. I don't. You know. Um, I. I think, you know, sometimes I fantasize about, well, if I won the lottery, what would I do? And I, you know, given what my experience is, I probably would set up some kind of charitable trust in order to, um, you know, sort of continue to pursue the goals that I've been exposed to in, in, this, in this work and, and to do things that like, our foundation doesn't um, do a lot with animal welfare groups, and, and I'm an animal nut, um, so I would want to do more in that area. And um, there are lots of resources at your fingertips on the web that mm -hmm. would show you what the um, all the regulations are, and there are a lot of administrative hoops that you have to go through and legal requirements. There, there, you know, because you are investing money in the the common the community's good so that you have to be thoughtful about that and you know going back to the idea of your board of trustees you would this would not be something that i would take on um, by myself i would want to have a group of people around me to provide different perspectives you definitely um, would call on an attorney and an accountant, even just to have a conversation with them, because it is, um, you know, you can have the best intentions of the world, but Laura Jean referenced before, you have to go to the data. There's a lot of reading involved and a lot of research involved in our work. It's not, you know, it's wonderful. I have a, a big check on the floor back there. I love the days when we get out the big check and write out the big amounts and start handing out the checks, but those that's two days a year. The other days are consumed with lots of research and reading, um, which is not to say it's impossible though. I worked with um, one attorney and an accountant to start the Nacotra Foundation. That was actually how I came to work here, just a couple of hours a week um, over the course of a year and a half. 
to, to set up the framework for the foundation because the Nicotras don't have children and their foundation is intended to be a legacy producing foundation. And the intention is that all of their businesses would someday revert to a social enterprise long in the future. Um, and so our intention is we're long distance runners. Um, we're building a foundation literally from the ground up. So it's been fascinating and it's been an education for me. All right, everybody, I have to go. Thank it's you, always, Laura Jean. Christine, it's always great to be with you. I'll call Thank you. Me. All right, be well. Thank you, Laura Jean. So I see a question from Stephen about how did St. John's academic learning affect me now? So I saved that for after Laura Jean was going since um, I wanted to get in information from her. So um, St. John's really did impact me in a number of ways, as I referenced before. Uh, I was on a variety of scholarships. I didn't have one scholarship. I had like a bunch of scholarships pieced together that were so helpful to me as I was pursuing my degree. And so it just fascinated me that there would be strangers willing to give back to someone they didn't know in such a generous way. And I became, um, I started volunteering for one of the groups, the Notre Dame College alumni who funded the most significant uh, scholarship that I received. And in doing that, um, the people who worked at the campus identified me as somebody who might be a good fundraiser. And that was, you know, very instrumental in the course of my career. Um, and then the academic service learning part, I, I was part of um, a variety of groups like the campus ministry group and the Vincentian, uh, different Vincentian groups. And I loved going on the midnight runs and I loved going um, to give back in the community and the thought that I could build a career that somehow bridged giving back, but also serve some other interests. I'm very interested in um, in management. I do love my for profit side of my job. Um, I love helping managers and helping team members, employees be their best selves. Um, and I love having a project or a problem and, and figuring it out, how we're going to create revenue streams. Um, so I'm very blessed that I was able to kind of find a job that is a perfect stew of all that. Um, Susan, do you want me to keep going? Yes, please. Um, okay. <laughs> did you, did you talk about the um, environmental projects. In sure. The so, uh, Say again. I think those are interesting and it's going to be something that's going to come up later in the semester too. Sure. Um, so we have a number of uh, things that we do as a for profit company to create um, some good impact on the environment, lessen our carbon footprint, lessen our negative impact. Um, as a hotel, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of food waste. And by food waste, I don't mean that we're throwing out food intentionally, but when you eat at a restaurant and you don't finish your meal and you decide not to take it home, I think for some reason, some people are embarrassed to take their food home. Take your food home. It's good for the environment because when the um, wait staff brings it back into the room, it's just going to get thrown out. So if you remember only one thing I say to you today, be bold and don't be embarrassed. Take your food home and eat it the next day. Um, so it, it pains me when I see almost full plates coming back because obviously that food is now waste. And, um, and that happens for a variety of reasons. You're at a wedding, you get up to dance, you don't feel like eating. It's not that the food's bad. It's just that, you know, people, and especially when there's plentiful food, like you just came from a cocktail hour, they don't eat it. So we have installed an ORCA system, which is O-R-C-A. It's a food waste system that converts food waste into liquid. It reduces our carbon footprint because we're not carting away massive amounts of waste. And also we're not dumping the waste into um, a dump. We also have um, a number of environmental um, sustainability efforts. For example, instead of putting pavers down in our walkways, we put permeable pavers, which allows rainwater to go into the soil. Um, we were recognized by the mayor's office of sustainability a few years back because we were able to um, make such big positive gains in terms of reducing waste from our hotel rooms, meaning that we um, work with a company called Clean the World and they pick up half used shampoo, half used hand cream. You know, when you go stay in a hotel and you kind of use a little bit of a bottle, but not the whole thing. 
and we converted our whole process to make it more green and environmentally friendly and um, be able to convert product. We recently did something very exciting. We uh, have a rooftop farm on our newest building. It's a 40,000 square foot rooftop farm. So that's a football field farm and it's on top of an eight story office building. And we worked with the Department of Environmental Protection and Brooklyn Grange, which uh, does rooftop farms around the world. And we're able to provide fresh food to our eateries on our campus and also donate fresh herbs and um, some fruit and veggies to local um, pantries, which we're going to enhance. Last year, we had our first growing season. Susan, I was on a call yesterday with Grow NYC and um, the person, and that's a, a wonderful group. If anybody's interested in looking at sustainability efforts and um, farm to table efforts for the average New Yorker, take a look at Grow NYC. And they kept referring to me as a farmer. They were like, well, the farmer from Staten Island. And I was like, so excited. I don't think I've ever been referred to as a farmer before. Um, so those are all you know, different ways that we do. We also uh, preserved a, a three acre site on one of our construction properties where we did not touch the trees, the full growth trees. And we've done that before. Uh, we're a very unique real estate development company. We've been um, recognized by the Arbor Day Foundation, A-R-B-O-R, -R, and they recognize people who um, preserve trees. So we have lifted steel over full growth trees to build our office buildings to preserve um, the native plants. And we have another nonprofit group called the Bloomfields Conservancy, and I'll make that the last part of the environmental piece. But for 30 years, the Nicochas have, have kept their 400 acre campus green and clean through our Bloomfields Conservancy. So we were not new to the nonprofit world. We were new to the grant making nonprofit world, but we were uh, a grant recipient many times. In fact, the Staten Island Foundation uh, has supported the Bloomfield Conservancy. I have a couple of more questions here. Maybe I'll just pick one more and then wrap up. Sure, that's good. Okay, um, let's see. So foundation, Susan, the, there's a couple here from you. I'm trying to pick one from the students. Let's see. How do you identify investments that are critical to the community? Oh, we did that one before. How do you start up funding? Okay. So Jonathan asks, do you see philanthropy as the best way to help serve a community or better a community? So Jonathan, that's a great question. That's a great question to end on too. So. Do I see philanthropy as a great way to help a community? I do. But I also recognize that philanthropy is a privilege that not all can invest or participate in. So one of my favorite phrases I learned when I was a fundraiser, and you could all kind of like tuck this in your back pocket and pull it out because I think it's always good to have a couple of phrases that are your go to if you're interviewing someday. I look for opportunities to give time talent or treasure. So I view time and talent as important as treasure, but I know society puts greater value on treasure. And they really, it, you know, I fight against that because just because you don't have the ability to write a check to support something doesn't mean you can't support it. So I do think a foundation is very important. We started off the conversation talking about how foundations can model philanthropy but I don't think I knew the word philanthropy until I was in college. Yet I grew up in a very generous household, generous in a different way. So um, I hope someday I am in the position, like Laura Jean said, if you win the lottery, you'd start a foundation. Um, I recognize that it took many years of the Nicotra's hard work to be in a position where they can be philanthropists. So not everyone is ready to be a philanthropist at every moment in their life, but you can still do good through time and talent. So maybe um, you build your community by volunteering. Maybe you build your community by speaking to a class. Maybe you build your community by going to an alumni event and talking to a current student someday. Um, the person who does our social media for Love Staten Island is actually a student on the St. John's Queens campus 
He was a high school student on Staten Island. He was our intern. He went to college in Queens and we kept him on and he worked remotely doing that community building. So, you know, he's paid to do it, but like me, you put in more, you know, when you're a social media manager, you kind of check in on it during the week, even when you're not kind of on the clock. Um, he He's doing good in that way. So there's all different ways you can give back and do good. Do I think foundations are instrumental? I do, but I think everybody sitting in the class right now is instrumental. And everyone who um, chooses to dine at our cafe, who might not give to the foundation, give to the groups we're giving to, but they're giving by choosing to have their burger with us. So everybody really can play a role. Um, and maybe as you get older and more secure financially, you can play the traditional role of the treasure, but everybody can do time and talent. Does anybody have any last minute questions? What? I think this is very helpful. And I think it's also excellent that you're an alumna of St. John's. And my daughter is a sophomore, so I'm a, a St. John's mom now, too. So we, uh, and, uh, you know, very, very passionate about what St. John's does. And I went to an event last year, and the person um, speaking was a St. John's alum. And he said, what I love about St. John's is it's a school of potential. And that um, you just, it's such a diverse school, but it's also a school where it's a school that has high expectations for their students and the impact they can have on the world. And I love that. So good luck to all of you. I hope to see you on LinkedIn or Instagram and thank you for the invitation. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye now.